Okay, I think I'll go ahead and get us started here. So hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the Urban Water Innovation Network Science Talk webinar series. Um, as our NSF funded sustainability research network is coming to a close, we have designed this series to specifically focus on key findings of each of the research projects with an emphasis on implications of the results and pragmatic recommendations for stakeholders and practitioners. Our first installment features Research Thrust A, which hinges on enhancing our fundamental understanding and characterization of the sustainability of urban water systems by comparing trends in the past with alternative future land and water use, population, and climate scenarios. We're kicking off the series today with a presentation from Dr. David Hondula at, uh, at Arizona State University. Uh, I am also thrilled that we have a couple of stakeholders and practitioners joining us today. Uh, hopefully we'll see Jane Gilbert on here, the world's first heat officer who should be tuning in from Miami. Uh, we also have Brendan Haggerty from the Multnomah County Health Department in Oregon, whose work also considers human health and heat interactions. Uh, be sure to tune in next week for a presentation on future water supply vulnerability from Dr. Maz Dakarabi, the Director of UN and Professor and Borland Chair of Water Resources at Colorado State University. Uh, as you probably noticed, we are recording this webinar, which will be posted um, to our YouTube channel and the video will also be available on the UN website. All participants should be muted as they enter the webinar, so you can use the chat queue to enter your questions and barring any technical difficulties, you can raise your hands uh, to unmute yourself at the end of the presentation and we're hoping to have a nice discussion directly with uh, Dr. Handula. So with that, I am excited to introduce our very first presenter, Dr. David Hondula, Associate Professor in the School of Geographical Science and Urban Planning. Dave's research focuses on the social and health effects of natural and technological hazards with an emphasis on extreme heat and power failures. His, he works closely with local and regional state and state authorities on the development and implementation of plans and programs to make communities safer and more resilient to extreme events. So Dave, I know we can see your slides. If you maybe want to turn on your camera, if you haven't already, feel free to do so. Oh, there we go. I see your beautiful face. So take it away. Thanks, Sarah. And thanks everyone for joining. And good morning from Arizona. Particular thanks to the practitioners who have uh, joined us and yeah, uh, Brendan certainly uh, is sending some uh, con condolences and interest in having some discussion later about the experience you all have had in the Pacific Northwest uh, er earlier this summer. Obviously, we've all been been following those headlines and stories quite uh, quite closely. Uh, as summer comes to a close across much of the United States, it seems appropriate to kick off our series with a conversation around heat and. I have a, a set of 30 or so slides we'll, we'll flip through. We'll talk about heat and public health and some connections with water. But given the, uh, get, you know, get, given the uh, modest attendance today, I think we have plenty of room for really good discussion among the participants. So I'll try not to take uh, all of the time and be sure we reserve plenty for a conversation. And uh, Sarah, thank you for the introduction, everything that you've been able to facilitate uh, across the entire UN network over our past five to six years of, of working together. Uh, if anyone cares to introduce themselves in the chat or maybe share anything they're thinking about, uh, please please do so. As Sarah mentioned, my name's Dave. I'm here in Arizona, trained in environmental science and climatology, although I've been, been increasingly uh, getting involved with more uh, public health and social science aspects of extreme heat. And hopefully you'll have uh, introduction to a mix of topics in the slides today. But if anyone wants to say hello in the chat, and we can certainly try to use the chat as a means of having a conversation uh, today, I'll try to keep it open here. And I'm sure Sarah will help keep an eye on it as well. There are many, many folks whose ideas and thoughts are reflected in the slides today. Here they are. We won't go through all, all of their names, uh, although I'll give a shout out to Sharon Harlan, who is one of my first mentors here at ASU, who is on the line with us today and has been leading some important UN initiatives that we will certainly hear about later in this series. But thanks to all collaborators for their thoughts. So for a little bit of context around public health and extreme heat, the most recent assessment we have in the United States suggests that on hot days, total mortality in the United States increases by about 5%. 
Uh, so for a place, uh, if we can imagine one giant extreme heat day that covered the entire United States, uh, the, in the entire country on an average day, we have about 10,000 deaths. So we'd be talking about something like 500 extra deaths if we had a really extreme heat day cover the entire country. Of course, that, you know, that never happens. Heat occurs in, in pockets, but just to put some numbers on us uh, around it. And for some good news, we're making tremendous progress as a society in our ability to cope with heat. This might be occurring because of intentional actions like heat warning systems, uh, like improving some of our response strategies in communities for helping people cope with heat occurs, uh, perhaps some good urban design strategies that are help, uh, help, helping people find shade and lower temperatures. But we've cut our heat-related mortality rate down by about two-thirds in the United States compared to where we were in the late 70s and early 80s. And this is the work of our colleague Scott Sheridan at Kent State University. The figures don't produce super well uh, on the slides. I've tried to grab them out of the paper, uh, but th this is the paper from which those numbers are derived. The red line on the left estimates how dangerous hot days are to not hot days and how that's changed over time. And you can see that steady decline, although perhaps some evidence of plateauing as we've moved into the uh, past, uh, the most recent decade. The other figure, which is a little bit noisier, estimates the percent of total deaths each year in our country that were attributable to heat. And you can see in some of the worst years, we've estimated that something like 0.2% of deaths across the entire country are attributable to heat. Whereas in some of the better years, that number gets quite close to zero. Those high years, the math works out to be somewhere around 6,000 deaths. And for those of you who are in the heat and public health world, you know that there's a really wide range of estimates for how many people die each year in the United States because of heat, 6,000 would be in the middle to high end of what we statistically attribute to hot weather. This uh, encouraging pattern that we see of declining heat-related mortality has been reproduced and, and uh, produced and reproduced in many studies uh, all over the world. And again, this is, a, this is an encouraging sign in our ability to cope with one of the deadliest weather-related hazards. The specific you know, degree to which the decline has occurred has varied from place to place. These patterns only exist in countries for which we have reliable data, and you can imagine what that, that map might look like. Uh, but of course, this is no guarantee that the future will not be one of great, uh, great concern as we move into uh, higher temperatures. Right now, we estimate that heat is a leading weather-related killer in the United States. This will vary. The proportion of deaths attributable to individual weather hazards varies from study to study. The most recent report from the U.S. National Center for Health Statistics estimates that approximately two-thirds of every weather-related deaths in the United States are, based, are attributable to cold, one-third heat, and every other hazard, including hurricanes, uh, account to a, a essentially uh, pocket change. Uh, the, the proportion here between cold heat and everything else certainly does vary from study to study. And there is concern as we move into a warmer future with perhaps fewer cold extremes and more heat extremes that this proportion could change. Uh, several years ago, a report from the federal government estimated that we'd see many, many additional heat related deaths in the relatively near future. Uh, as a consequence of these rising temperatures. Uh, you might remember the baseline I suggested earlier, somewhere in the, you know, we currently experience somewhere in the thousands of heat related deaths each year. And here the report was suggesting a more than doubling by a time period as soon as 2030. And we can find scientific papers across the peer reviewed literature that make similar projections. Clearly if there's a statistical association between high temperatures and elevated mortality, or morbidity, and we have more high temperatures in the future, we would certainly expect there to be uh, more adverse impacts at that time. And because of this projection, we've seen just a tidal wave of interest in extreme heat uh, in the media, from the private and public and philanthropic sectors, and even in local, state, and federal government. This is just a snapshot of some activities that have taken place over the past, uh, past few years some reports from the Union of Concerned Scientists, from the Ars Rockefeller Foundation, and then uh, for those who have been, 
been involved in the heat world, you're likely aware there's some pending legislation on the floor of the Senate and more recently the House. And there have been a number of committee, uh, committee hearings and subcommittee hearings on both sides as well related to extreme heat. So this is a, this is a hazard that is, is already serious, has been serious in the United States for a long time. While we are making progress in reducing some of the impacts, there's great concern across a wide variety of sectors about where we are headed. Again, it's captured the media attention. The current impacts already are quite consequential uh, in terms of their economics. These numbers here are just for Maricopa County, where I live here in Arizona. We estimated that the value of the lost life last year due to heat alone was somewhere between half a billion and $3 billion. And a couple of years ago, the most recent time period for which we have uh, hospitalization and emergency room data, we're talking about at least eight figures there as well. Of course, heat health impacts are about more than deaths and about more than dollars. Uh, here's a quote, and we'll talk more about where this quote came from in a little while. Uh, but I think this quote does a nice job of illustrating the, the suffering and the day-to-day -day impacts on quality of life and comfort and convenience that heat uh, heat imposes beyond some of the most acute impacts that we talked about before. And these types of data are not as uh, not as well collected, not as universally universally available, just don't have good indicators of this uh, suffering and impact on day-to-day -day life that we think is also quite consequential. We do have some middle ground data, I would call it, from, uh, from social surveys that have been collected in, in Arizona and indeed in other locations. Just a couple of data points here to give a sense of the scale and some of the survey work that's been done here. Somewhere between a quarter and a third, maybe even a little more than a third of households report some adverse impact on their day-to-day -day quality of life associated with hot weather, whether it's reporting symptoms of heat-related illness or feeling too hot inside their home. And some of this uh, work was pioneered by my close colleague, Sharon Harlan, who is with us today. Sharon's work and uh, indeed that of a growing uh, community also demonstrate that there are clear social patterns in the populations that are experiencing more severe impacts from heat. Uh, this is work that Sharon uh, was a part of with our UN colleague, Daryl Generet in 2016. Uh, that shows a pattern that has been now reproduced many times for many other cities around the country in which people who live in hotter neighborhoods are suffering from heat illness at a higher rate. There's an adjacent literature that talks about the uh, long-term development patterns that have led to certain neighborhoods being hotter than others. And we talk about different places being hotter than others. It can really be of a, a consequential scale. Uh, here's a little cartoon estimating what the quote, urban heat island intensity was in the Phoenix metropolitan area last summer. This is looking at early morning temperatures when the urban heat island amplitude is maximized. And we're talking about something like a 13 degree Fahrenheit difference between the center of the city and the surrounding areas. In some of our UN work, we've estimated that this extra heat in the region associated with urbanization might be statistically responsible for upwards of one third of the heat associated deaths in our region. So if we were able to somehow remove the urban heat island or erase these urban heat island effects, we could bring our heat associated death rate down by about one third. And of course, this is motivating many of the heat mitigation strategies that are being pursued by, by cities and other partners here and certainly in other cities around the country. It's not just this regional urban heat island effect, though, that's of consequence. We know there are large differences even between relatively proximate communities. And this was work, again, that Sharon pioneered uh, yeah, as, as early as, as 2006. Here we're looking at a little cartoon of some data from last summer. These two locations in Canto Park and Sky Harbor Airport are located just a few miles from each other. Both would fall within what we consider the metropolitan core of the Phoenix metropolitan area. Again, looking at early morning temperatures here, a huge difference, 7.2 degrees Fahrenheit. We know that the impacts of temperature on human health are non-linear. As we move toward higher and higher temperatures, the human health impacts get uh, disproportionately worse and worse and worse. So it's, it's not as though th this, there's a linear relationship is that as we move from Encanto to Sky Harbor, it's no, no. the equivalent of 7.2 degrees worse, but we can think about uh, even a multiplied effect from there. So just to summarize a little bit of what we see looking at the uh, past and looking into the future, 
uh, to summarize what we've talked about thus far, nearly every retrospective study that's looked at what's happening with heat health over time shows a decline. This is good news that our society appears, at least from a mortality perspective, increasingly able to cope uh, with heat. Although I'll note that, of course, mortality is not the only indicator of, of how heat might be impacting uh, our lives and, and ecosystems more generally. Uh, prospective studies looking forward indicate dramatic increases in future heat impacts. Of course, our goal is to take that red line and turn it, uh, you know, to turn it down to the right or perhaps another way of frame it. Can we keep that blue line going as we move into the future? And that question has motivated some of our work in UN related to water. And it is the position of many scholars, I would argue, in the UN network that water is going to be a critical part of our heat resilience story. And those of us on the line can probably imagine many connections between water and heat resilience. And I thought it would be interesting to see what your ideas are. So why don't we ponder for just 30 seconds what we think some connection is between water and heat health and hold that thought in your mind for a moment. We'll try a little uh, waterfall exercise here in the chat. So think of some connection, if, if you're willing to play along, some connection between water and heat health or heat resilience. Type it in the chat, but wait to hit that enter button until I give the cue, then we'll all get to see each other's answers together. So what, are, what is a possible connection between water and heat resilience? As a little bit of a preview, I'll be going into three different types of connections and sprinkling in some of our UN findings. We'll spend a lot of time on one and then briefly touch on two others and then have plenty of time for discussion. All right, so let's see in the chat window what folks think are the, uh, are the connections between water and heat health. And I see a number of ideas coming in here. All right, I, Mike starts us off with humidity bad and Ellie providing uh, some ideas about cooling strategies, very good. Individual hydration, Catherine, thank you for that. Yeah, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, heat evaporates water, hydration for people living outdoors. Yeah, Brendan, we certainly read some of the challenges uh, there this summer with some of the, the outdoor related heat deaths. Cooling off in water, fountains, pools. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I love, uh, love all these ideas. Uh, Sharon, uh, with inter interesting connection there across multiple systems. We need water for energy. We need energy for, uh, for indoor cooling. Yeah, fantastic. So let's dive into a couple of these, just skimming to see if I missed any other themes. Yeah, let's dive in. So I see some evapotranspiration ideas uh, here, evaporative cooling, I, I, absolutely. Let's jump into that one first. And an important theme for many UN researchers, we'll be hearing more about this, I imagine from Daryl Generet in uh, future parts of this series, is the use of water for uh, vegetation or what we might more broadly define as cooling and living infrastructure. And one of the themes of our UN research in, in our particular group has been thinking about the different types of temperatures that are affected by different heat mitigation strategies. And on this, uh, this cartoon, we can see our, our little uh, our friend there is standing in the sun and standing in the shade provided by a tree. And we have estimates of different types of temperatures in those two different conditions, in the sun and in the shade. And we often, as society focus on that middle number, the reduction in air temperature. But there are two other temperatures on the slide here, the surface temperature, the temperature of the ground, and critically the radiant temperature, which is some type of indication of what the human body is actually experiencing, that have a much, much, much larger difference between these two conditions. And we've been focusing a lot on measuring those radiant temperatures across a wide spectrum of urban infrastructures. Some of our work measuring radiant temperatures looks like this. So here's my colleague, Ariana Medell with her friend, uh, Marty. Marty is a biometeorological cart that measures all of the variables in the environment that impact how the uh, human body responds to hot or cold environments. So Mike said earlier, uh, humidity bad. 
and in some of your parts of the country, uh, you are already quite familiar with the a type of biometeorological index called the heat index, which combines temperature and humidity. Uh, Jane Gilbert has joined us from Miami, where they might be our, our country's leaders from a heat index uh, perspective. But maybe some places in the, in the southern Midwest are. We can talk about that, that later. So we're already familiar with the idea of combining different variables together to get some sort of index. What we capture with this biometeorological char, uh, cart is not only the temperature and humidity effects, but also the effects of all of the radiation in the environment, sunlight hitting our body, radiation coming from other surfaces, which turn out to be super consequential, especially here in our dry climate in Arizona. So we'll take the cart out and walk different transects, trying to intersect with many different features in the urban landscape. And I know you can't see all the details on this figure particularly well, but just notice the color scale on the top. This is a mean radiant temperature reported in degrees Celsius. The left end of the scale here is somewhere in the high 90s Fahrenheit. The right end of the scale is uh, super, super hot. We're moving into the 150s, 160s Fahrenheit. And we can observe that really, really wide range in radiant temperatures across a very small area. This is one moderately sized urban park uh, here in, in Tempe, adjacent to Phoenix. And you can see that the cart intersected with places that have the highest MRTs on the scale and the lowest. The air temperature across this park might vary by a, a fraction of a degree Fahrenheit, maybe one, maybe, maybe two. Another way to, to look at this uh, data uh, is, is here where the mean radiant temperature across a variety of urban surfaces, and we highlighted a few examples there in those pictures are shown. So the radiant temperatures are shown in the bars on the graph here. Again, you can see that tremendous variability in the radiant temperature in the urban environment, anywhere between uh, 150 Fahrenheit, give or take down into the 90s. And as you look at the different pictures, perhaps you can start to see some of the different surfaces that are contributing to making these places hotter or cooler from a radiant temperature perspective. As a point of reference, the red dots on this figure show the air temperature. And you can see how the variability in radiant temperature absolutely dwarfs that of air temperature. In this particular project, which was in the city of Scottsdale, Arizona, the mean radiant temperature variability was approaching 60 degrees Fahrenheit as we move through places that are literally within you know, a half mile or, or one mile of one another. Uh, as a side note, yeah, if you look at that picture 115, or W15 rather, it has these concrete or stone tiles that are separated by artificial turf. The artificial turf that's in between those concrete or stone tiles, uh, the artificial turf was home to the absolute highest surface temperature that me, we measured anywhere in this entire project. Every hot garbage can, hot road surface, they were not competitive with this artificial turf in between those stone tiles, which is a, a interesting point of discussion in the water world because I think we see encouragement from local governments to, for folks to remove grass landscapes for water conservation. Some of them are putting in artificial turf, but we're potentially making a big trade-off there in how hot our yards and cities are. There's certainly some attention to air temperature out there in the broader community. I'm not suggesting we need to ignore air temperature. And in fact, there's a lot of encouragement in the climate modeling world when we think about air temperature as we move into the future and what we might be able to do with effective urban heat mitigation strategies. The, uh, the red, or so the maroon and gold envelopes on this figure show the projected temperature change of our hot days in Arizona moving forward. These are based on downscaled global climate models, you find similar figures across a wide variety of national and global assessments. The arrows here uh, are, are meant to represent the amount of cooling that my colleague Matt Georgescu has projected is possible from widespread urban heat mitigation strategies. And one of his well-cited papers in the Proceedings of the National Academy from a few years ago uh, highlight, it highlights this point in the title that effective urban heat mitigation strategies can literally roll back the warming that we're expecting from global scale climate change you can see, for example, that arrow, if we follow this lower emission scenario, the arrow representing our urban heat mitigation strategies actually goes below the zero line. So we could wind up with a cooler future in our cities from an air temperature perspective, even with modest global scale warming. 
And Alex, thank you for the uh, comment. Uh, sim similar experience uh, here. There's a really rich literature that we won't get into talking about trade-offs between water use and uh, urban cooling strategies. Uh, and I just certainly encourage folks to, to dive into some of the literature on this topic, some of which has come from ASU, but there's certainly a, a really rich global pool at this point. We've been trying to invoke uh, some of the principles from this literature, like the point that's highlighted here, uh, greatest reductions in temperatures occur in least vegetated neighborhoods, and we're thinking about increasing uh, tree canopy. We've been trying to put some of those principles into a prioritization scheme for the City of Phoenix's Cool Corridors Initiative, which was funded in the most recent city budget, and we'll be adding each year as we move into the future, uh, something like 200 trees per mile to each of nine separate project areas. Uh, there are a number of interesting questions the city has that we're trying to, to help with. For example, which corridors should we pick? Where should we start? And then a second set of questions around what the design of these cool corridors could be that could maximize benefits. We've had the chance to develop some shading and thermal comfort guidelines for an active transportation planning toolbox from our regional planning organization. And one of the uh, one of the benchmarks that we're trying to incorporate into the Cool Corridors project in Phoenix and indeed other projects is recommended shade targets for walking routes. Uh, this these benchmarks are based on climatological assessment of how hot, from a comprehensive perspective, uh, different streets might be and how much exposure the human body can handle as it moves across a 20 minute walking segment before it might require rest. And we can talk um, more about that in great detail, but we are encouraging the city of Phoenix to aim for this excellent shade coverage benchmark of 60%. I'll note for those who are on the line from other locations, uh, your targets might be different than, uh, than these targets, which are derived for the Phoenix climatological context. We had the chance to dive into some other aspects of water and infrastructure challenges through a community engagement process led by the Nature Conservancy's Arizona chapter called Nature's Cooling Systems. And I was so pleased and proud to be able to be a part of this project that has produced uh, heat action plans for what might be called three heat vulnerable communities in the Phoenix metropolitan area. Uh, these were developed through a series of community workshops uh, held over the course of the summer a couple of years ago. Uh, these plans and the associated heat action planning guide, we're very happy to share, have more than 25,000 downloads at this point from the ASU library website alone. Uh, hopefully most of those are authentic, uh, authentic downloads, but we invite you to, to uh, check them out as well. A really wide range of topics addressed in these documents, but perhaps as no surprise, residents of these neighborhoods are very interested in seeing more urban heat mitigation strategies in their neighborhoods that use water in some way, whether they be uh, trees or other types of features. I saw uh, sprinklers and play areas were highlighted by Jane in the chat earlier, and that was a particular priority in one community. But our engagement with the residents helped us understand some of the layers of complexity associated with uh, living infrastructure. Here's a, a quote, sorry for all the words on the slide, directly, uh, direct, directly lifted from the document. And in one particular neighborhood, new trees are not desired until old dead trees can be removed. And although I, I don't think folks in city government are ignorant to this phenomenon, I have not heard any strategies proposed for tree removal as part of our heat conversations with, with multiple cities. So I think this is a, a case, a good example where really intimate knowledge with the, the problem as voiced by residents could hopefully uh, will hopefully lead to some, some new programs being, uh, being stood up. And we can certainly have a much longer conversation about what this uh, process looked like and some of the ideas brought forward uh, from residents, uh, but, but we are absolutely trying to implement programs and strategies that will reflect these priorities uh, over the coming years. <clears throat> okay, we're gonna shift now, and I know we're moving along quite quick, quickly to try to leave time for conversation. I just wanted to highlight two other connections between uh, water and heat health that we've had the chance to pursue here in UN. And one of them is related to power failures. And unfortunately, uh, we're seeing this intersection play out in the Gulf Coast right now. I thought I saw some 
Uh, some mentioned in the chat here earlier of using water for personal cooling. We've had a tremendous increase in the number of major electrical grid disturbances in the United States over the past several decades. And this trend is unfortunately expected to continue for a wide variety of reasons, including aging infrastructure, including increased uh, stress and demand on our grid system, and of course, uh, increasing frequency of different hazard types that affect the grid. And we've had the chance to ask people how they would cope with such an occurrence in the warm season, particularly here uh, in Phoenix, but a couple of other countries, uh, a couple of other cities around the country as well. And one of our uh, undergraduate research program participants, Tiffany Justice, took a look at a wide range of re uh, interview responses. I think at, at the time we had responses from something like uh, 40 different uh, households in the Phoenix metropolitan area, looking at, and she coded for examples of different ways that people would cope with what we might call a heat disaster or a simultaneous uh, heat wave and power failure event in the, the summer months. And Tiffany found that water was uh, absolutely a, a widely used strategy. Uh, water was a widely used resource in this hypothetical scenario that we asked participants to engage with, uh, certainly for, for drinking, but we see some other ways in which water were used as well as we listen to uh, listen to the interviews, whether it's using it for cleaning, uh, for cooling as ice, uh, for evaporative cooling, putting wet cloths on the body, and, and so on. There's a parallel project uh, that my colleague Liza Kurtz has been conducting, talking to emergency managers and other professionals uh, who might be involved in responding to a heat disaster, learning about what services and strategies they plan to implement if such an event occurs. And there are some interesting uh, intersection points and perhaps some points of misalignment uh, that, that we're beginning to see between what the public expects will be avail available in terms of water resources and what some of our resource providers are, are planning. And of course, we'll be trying to plug those gaps in the coming years. Finally, one other uh, connection just to highlight briefly before we move into conversation, another uh, project we're happy to feature from our first undergraduate research program participant, Alana Kaiser, who's there on the left, uh, we had the chance to think about the use of water for thermal comfort. And I saw, I certainly saw this theme in the chat earlier as well. Here in the desert Southwest and perhaps in your parts of the country as well, uh, using these evaporative misters for comfort is a relatively common summertime strategy. I mean, in a summer day, we can't walk down any main street here without seeing these, these misters uh, firing away. Uh, here are some different pictures of misters in action. Hopefully uh, folks on the line are familiar with those. And for us, this was a very clear use of water for thermal comfort, a trade-off between using one resource uh, to hope, you know, to ideally feel cooling, uh, feel cooler or more comfortable. And we were curious if that was working, uh, what sort of trade-offs there were, what the attitudes were around this, and uh, could we measure a, a cooling effect? So we had different instrumentation out uh, in the city looking at these different uh, misters. I know this figure is a little bit complicated. We'll take just a moment to, to introduce it. We, we made measurements of the thermal environment in four different conditions, ranging from the what we might consider the worst condition being in the open exposed sun with no mist, those are the bright gold bars, to what we might call the best condition being in the shade and in a misted environment. And as the manufacturers of these misting systems would, uh, would uh, ha ha hope uh, to see the case, we did see that thermal conditions, for the most part, were better in misted areas than uh, in the not misted areas. Using some of these more complex biometeorological indices like mean radiant temperature, MRT, physiological equivalent temperature, PET, and the Universal Thermal Comfort Index, UTCI, we were really able to capture the different dynamics on the human body in terms of how providing mist in the absence of shade or shade in the absence of mist uh, play with one another. And we were able to see, and I'll just draw your attention to the rightmost cluster of bars, that when we can combine those two effects, we get nearly twice the effect that we would have from either strategy alone. So mist and shade combined produces nearly twice the effect that we can get from mist and shade. The choice between mist and shade seemed to depend on which particular variable we were looking at. 
in most cases, we found that if you can choose between one or the other, it would be preferable to use shade instead of mist. In another part of this uh, project, we had the chance to ask a, a couple handfuls of business managers about their decision making around Mr. Use. And they all said that they were using these systems uh, for customer comfort and uh, aesthetics. And they weren't really thinking about water use when it came to these misters. In fact, when we directly asked them, do you know how much water your mister uses? The vast majority of this very small sample uh, said no. And some folks were interested to learn more about uh, the water use. We made some, uh, some uh, I'll call them soft measurements of uh, water use from misters. And our current estimate, although this wasn't particularly systematic, our current estimate is that water use through misters is probably in the same ballpark as the amount of water that would be flushed through toilets at a typical uh, restaurant or bar establishment. Uh, but there's certainly an opportunity to do some more work there to really quantify what this, uh, what this trade off is. Jane, I see your question. No, we did not have the chance to test the impact of misters in humid climates. Uh, you would certainly expect their performance to be worse. Uh, and perhaps even counterproductive in some, some situations, but yeah, we'd, we'd really love to, uh, love to do that work moving forward. So I'm sure Sarah is giving me the hairy eyeball that we need to wrap up. Uh, I hope some of these slides have given us an introduction uh, to heat or maybe some talking points to urban heat as one of our contemporary challenges for health, quality of life, uh, equity, and we've given just a couple of examples of how we think water is a critical component of the solution set. Uh, we're gonna need water to make our cities cooler, to help our infrastructure perform better. We're gonna need water to help people in emergency situations. And it, I mean, it seems as though we're gonna be using water in pursuit of our daily comfort and commercial interests. Some topics that I'd love to hear your perspectives uh, on. Do we think that cities have sufficient impact data to pursue good programs and policies? And we have, and, and cities can be interpreted broadly here, uh, but we have a couple of people on the line who are explicitly or perhaps implicitly in charge of implementing heat solutions for their jurisdiction. And we'd be curious to hear your opinion, uh, how well prepared you appear, feel that you can do so based on what the scientific community has produced or other communities. Uh, is our urban infrastructure prepared for heat more generally? Uh, as we see cities begin to reorient their governance for heat, what skills and capacities are most important to build in local government? Do we need infrastructure experts? Do we need climate experts? Do we need community engagement experts? What's important uh, to build in local government? And then my colleague Kelly Turner at UCLA has a commentary uh, out from just a couple weeks ago, uh, suggesting this idea of, uh, I, I believe she called them cool community standards for the United States. Uh, this broader idea, can and should urban heat be regulated like air pollution? I, I thought it was a particularly thought provoking piece uh, that she provided and perhaps we'll have some conversation there as well. So thanks for listening, uh, listening to me uh, ramble on here for about a half hour. We have about 15 minutes left for discussion. And I will turn it back over to Sarah to help moderate that conversation. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Dr. Hondula. It's always great to, to hear from you and hear um, wonderful connection with the audience. Really appreciate the, those questions and polls uh, to get people engaged. So yeah, we'd, we'd love to hear from our, our practitioners that are joining us today, uh, Brendan or, or Jane or even um, Susan, do you have any, any comments on the, the research and results that you heard? And we will also say as, uh, as they are preparing their excellent questions, you know, we as the academic community absolutely need you know, encouragement and guidance to know what to be working on to help you the best. We, ha we have some ideas, but those are not always uh, particularly uh, well aligned with what can really be, be helpful today. Well, let me um, just mention something, and I would defer to Jane Gilbert, who is working 24-7 on this issue. Um, so I've been uh, working, I'm Susan Glickman, I'm the Florida Director of Southern Alliance Clean Energy, and I've been working on climate and energy issues now for 22 years. Um, in this state and across the region and in other capacities. Um, 
you know, we've focused a lot in Florida on sea level rise, you know, sort of as a way to get people to understand the need for climate action, right? But, you know, like, I, it's great, I'm wearing a pink shirt. Pink is the new black, right? So heat is the new sea level rise because it's something people feel. So I do a lot of work in central Florida, for instance, and most of them, you know, Orlando doesn't have sea level rise. So I just want to um, just appreciate the work and try to figure out how we take this kind of scary, dismal situation, but put it on the head of a pin that people can understand, you know, regular folks and how do we move policymakers? You know, I always say we like don't really need that much more research and that many more reports. Like we know this is a problem. Now what do we do? So that's kind of the, the space that I, I live in. So I really appreciate it. And as I said, taking what you've done and, and trying to put it in a little graphic because people don't read anymore, you know, for whatever, you know, uh, so dealing, dealing with our, our societal reality. So, so that's, re that's really it. I just, it's super important is I guess the main thing I wanted to say. Uh, th thanks. Thanks, Susan. And yeah, point, point well taken as you know, somebody who might be involved in producing uh, some reports. I, I appreciate your comment that we may have enough of those uh, at this point. And I'll, I'll share one. Uh, I guess it's a low light from that uh, nature's cooling systems project. You know, you said, uh, maybe I'll challenge one point. You said that you know, we, we need to help people realize this is a problem. I don't think I'm capturing your words uh, quite correctly. Uh, our sense, at least you know, here in Arizona, is that there is a tremendous population of people who have no, no problem at all articulating that this is a problem. They can talk about their friend who got sick, their relative who died, their ice cream that melts on the way home from the grocery store every day. Or like, like heat is a real challenge that millions of Americans can excellently articulate uh, in, in many different ways. But the conduits into government aren't working for them or are not there. At least in, in our experience, we, we had the chance for a Kind of a, a mid-level city park employee to come participate in when one of these meetings they were talking about designing new bathroom and water fountain in the community park and one resident you know, got, got very emotional in the meeting and said this is the first time i've ever had the chance to talk to anyone from city government and we were like you know talking about where a water fountain would go in, in a park so i think and I think as we have folks like Jane coming on, on board, there's going to be a mechanism to have this conversation that uh, we haven't done a very good job of, of creating more broadly. So I don't know if that's a, it's not a clean response to your uh, 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 prompt. But. No, but, 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 but between heat and other impacts of climate change, people don't see it as any immediate urgent threat. And I think heat probably has a better chance of that. So again, when you work on this for a long time, one of the problems has been this perception that it's down the road. And so that, that's where I think heat, and again, I'm being like practical, how do we use this problem to move the action? And, you know, I think heat has the potential, but I think it's that sense of urgency and it's just something people feel every day, you know, most days, at least where I live. So anyway, I appreciate all your, all y'all's work. Thanks, Susan. No, I agree, Susan. And I, it certainly, heat was something that, you know, we started our work focusing on sea level rise here in Miami, to your point, and um, that's continuing that work, of course. Uh, but, but as we did outreach in neighborhoods, heat came up a lot and more and more as a, as a, a broader scale problem, particularly for our greater than 50% that has a trouble making ends meet at the end of the day. Um, so it's, it's, it, it does touch more lives, particularly here in Miami, where our waterfront and our low-lying areas are, um, the majority of them, not all of them, but the majority of them are higher valued real estate and higher valued properties. Um, it's, it's our interiors that, um, it's a broader population that's getting currently impacted. So uh, we do have lots, of, uh, there's plenty of uh, data to act now, but there are some real data gaps. And it was your, your, your presentation was hugely valuable. I hope I can get a copy of it um, because it's so encouraging to see how much can be done by re reduce, addressing the urban heat island, which is clearly a local government uh, uh, opportunity. 
I think historically, you know, Miami-Dade County isn't a health department, right? It's the health department is run by the state. There is a local county office of health. But so, but even that health department hasn't really focused that much on heat. And part of this is to, you know, I've worked with Catherine Toms is also on, who's been a leader with the Florida Clinicians for Climate Action. The data that we're getting on mortalities and, and hospitalizations is, <clears throat> is likely grossly underreported. And uh, so it's hard for us to really quantify the impacts. And certainly the, to your point earlier, David, the impacts um, to quality of life and maybe chronic diseases and other, and to, uh, and to livelihoods, to outdoor and, and un, un air conditioned work environments. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. Couple of issues that came up in your presentation that I wanna do more research on, the artificial turf. So yeah, we have a lot of athletic fields moving more and more to artificial turf. And now I know the Florida Athletics Association is requiring them to uh, install monitors of the wet global temperature on the fields and report it. I think this is great data and we can, Attra uh, attach which ones are artificial turf and which ones aren't, and maybe analyze some of that data. That's an opportunity to really, because, because more and more artificial turf is the recommendation, whether it's at schools or in park sites, et cetera, for an athletic field, because it drains easy and the maintenance and the, et cetera. But if we're trading that off with, you know, Dif big differentials in heat. I think that that's something we should all go in with our eyes open about. Um, I am interested in the misters and the impact here. Uh, I know our zoo use them, uses them. I don't know, Michael, if, if, if you know of other areas that use it here locally, but I wanna talk to them because we're, we're considering looking for some grants to do a combination of tree canopy and misters along major thoroughfares. And, but I need to understand more what, how those work in a humid environment. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I just had dinner in Coral Gables last night and they had one of those swamp cooler type things, you know, blowing the humidified air out. Uh, actually, it was a little too windy for us so we asked to have it turned off and it was right after a big storm too. So, but anyway, I think that uh, we could certainly use that kind of research data to find out what the impacts are here, how beneficial it is. So yeah. that's something maybe we can collaborate on somehow. Yeah. Just to, I, I see that we have uh, Catherine and Brendan's uh, hand up, uh, just to highlight a comment Sharon made in the chat about playgrounds as well as these other recreational surfaces that are important to think about. And the my, my understanding is that the conversation in, in that space has been for the past few decades around safety and the idea that it's much, quote, safer to fall on artificial turf than it might be on wood chips, uh, let's say. But that concept of safety has missed this heat angle completely. And I think we're seeing the playground certifying uh, groups uh, evolving and doing research to, to think about that angle as well. Yeah, just one quick comment on that. I, I, I agree, and we're actually partnered with our parks on um, a lot of tree planting in our playgrounds, but also installing sensors to monitor the impact over time. I mean, playgrounds are where young children and pregnant women are to, to air populations that are more vulnerable. Let's go to Catherine, who I think beat Brendan to the hand up button by just a few seconds. Oh, but Catherine uh, also needs to get that mute button. There Sorry, I'll be quick. It's nice to be around like-minded people. It's inspiring. And thank you for that really cool data on the turf. It really opens up the, a, a way so that we don't make mistakes in putting in uh, artificial turf. And also with the misters in, in South Florida, that may not be the right route because of the wet bulb uh, uh, temperature. The human thermal maximum is... 95 degrees Fahrenheit for, for that, isn't it? So we may be, that may be not a great solution for us, but we'll have to look into that. 
I, I really agree with the data. There, there does need to be more data, and they're talking about that a lot in South Florida, and I've been trying to find out how we can make the data better because there are all these uncaptured impacts. And I was thinking, and there have been some studies, I can't think of them right now, if we could maybe uh, get hospital admissions and um, emergency room admissions for not only heat related illnesses, but are there more heart attacks on hot days? Are there more lung um, disease admissions, asthma admissions uh, for exacerbation, preterm birth admissions on those hot days? I know that um, Bruce Becker did a did a great study with uh, Nate De Nicola last year. To, if we could do that at the local level here in South Florida, but other places too, and and get that the areas around ho those hospitals, they might be urban heat islands, and so we could focus on that, and that would show the data. Uh, kidney disease, if there's more. Uh, you know, people that are on dialysis, they, they have to be admitted more often on those, ex especially hot days. That would be a really good, I think, uh, study to do, especially in South Florida, but everywhere. And then one thing that's real, I wonder if you all could would want to work on this or brainstorm. I'm worried about the outdoor workers. I'm worried about the kids that are playing football outside. Some die, you know, almost every year in Florida, no matter what's done. Emergency wise, I wonder if you could find a way to, and I've spoken with Cheryl Holder about this brainstorming, uh, to have emergency blankets. I know there's some cooling blankets. I know there are the evaporative vests, but then you have the trouble in um, um, humid areas that those may not work real well because they're evaporative, right? You have that problem again. But I was thinking like the outdoor worker, the construction worker who is on the verge of heat stroke, they need immediate attention. They need to cool down. They need to be like submerged in ice water. So how do you get that to them on the fields? And I was wondering, is there a way to develop a blanket or even a suit? You can just put them in. And I think they're, I need to check this, but I think they're like chemically or physically activated cooling mechanisms. We need a biomedical engineer to help with that or somebody, but I would love to see something like that because I think it could save lives. I'm worried about those outdoor workers. Yeah, th thanks, uh, thanks, Catherine. Great, great ideas. There are a couple, uh, I'll follow up over email, but a couple of laboratories and groups that come to mind. I'm neither a physiologist nor an engineer, but uh, aware of some of that work that's happening. And one particular group you mentioned where it was athletes and in the United States, we are fortunate to have the Corey Stringer Institute at the University of Connecticut uh, leading the charge on some of this. Corey Stringer was a, a NFL a football player who died from heat stroke a number of years ago. And uh, my understanding is that the settlement with the NFL involved creating this large research enterprise that is pursuing the types of solutions that you're talking about. Sharon has dropped a link in the chat that I suspect is one of the Phoenix-based studies looking at uh, heat impacts on a wide variety of illness types. She spearheaded some of that work here. I don't know off the top of my head the extent to which it's been reproduced in South Florida. Uh, I also haven't looked at the link, so I might be guessing wrong. Um, but uh, but yes, I liked your question there about the medical data for South Florida as well. We have two minutes left. Brendan's been very patiently uh, waiting. Brendan, uh, maybe as, as a prompt for you, here in Central Arizona, health departments have been the de facto heat leads for a long time driving the conversation have, have you found yourself in this same role there and and what questions and ideas do you have yeah i would certainly say that health departments have been uh, a leader on on heat issues um in urban heat although you know we've had strong partnerships from academia and from um our urban forestry uh interests um you know i i think the the health impacts of heat were really driven home by our our event in June, where you know a, a heat related death was nearly unheard of here. Um, you know, we've had just two in this county of eight hundred thousand people over the past decade, and then in the space of a week, um, we had sixty two confirmed heat related deaths, um, and you know an additional probably twenty um excess deaths from from other causes um 
and that has sent us reeling. So I really appreciated the uh, the research you shared on misting. Um, that's something that we've we've pivoted toward in subsequent, although more minor heat waves this summer. Um, and I think I wanted to suggest a, a, a maybe a research path for that is um, the effect, effectiveness for specific populations. We've been deploying misting, misting stations in parks um, with the hope that that's a more accessible cooling intervention for um, the houseless population who can maybe maybe get cooling within sight of their possessions rather than having to move to a cooling center. Um, and that's been a very low cost uh, and easy intervention. Um, also appreciated uh, the research that you presented on um, radiant heat and um, you know av avoiding reliance on just satellite based uh, measurements of heat. Uh, we've been trying to move toward you know, developing a, a high resolution surface of uh, air temperature on hot days. Um, and this shows us a, a path forward. And I'll just finish by saying, um, you know, in the public health discipline as a whole, I think is comfort most comfortable with a systematic review. Um, and, you know, so some of the interventions that we've talked about today don't really show up in like the, the, the big guidance documents from CDC or EPA um, and a systematic review is one of the ways to get there. So thank you for having me. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Brendan. And thanks for everything you're doing on the front lines there of that emergency in the Northwest. Uh, one of our UN colleagues, Scott Cranehoff, has recently published a systematic review on some heat mitigation strategies. They have the a bang for your buck ratio for a couple of different cooling strategies, although, as you mentioned, not necessarily these more exploratory ones. And uh, I mean, you had a number of great comments. I really appreciate the one at the intersection of providing cooling where people are so they don't have to move their possessions. Uh, some of you might have seen the news that the city of Phoenix is under a Department of Justice investigation for mishandling of people's possessions in that circumstance. And of course, there's a really, really strong intersection there with heat challenges. Sarah, we are at 10.02, so you probably are uh, anxious to wrap this up. <laughs> I don't have any hairy eyeballs. That's the first I've ever heard that uh, expression, so I'll have to keep that in my back pocket. But uh, thank you, everybody, and, and a special thanks to all of our practitioners that are joining us and creating a great dialogue. Uh, it's lovely to see you and, and meet many of you uh, virtually for the first time. Um, I will be sure to follow up once we have uh, the video processed and posted, so you can share that with uh, any of your colleagues. It'll be available on the UN website as well as our YouTube page. So uh, we will be back next Wednesday. Uh, we'll meet every Wednesday until about October 13th, I believe, is our last one for Thrust A. So feel free to tune back in. The Zoom link will remain the same for the whole series, and I will follow up with more information. Thank you, Dave, for your wonderful presentation and, and engaging everyone in such a meaningful way. It's good to see you all. Take care. Happy Wednesday. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.